All right. Any questions from anything we talked about last time? So we started talking about some of our pain meds, went over our uh, NSAIDs, acetaminophen, started getting into the opioids a little bit. How do opioids work? Good. They work good, yes. <laughs> they work real good. Okay, what? How, how specifically do they work? Okay. They work on opioid receptors. Which one specifically? Mu is the one, right? We're speaking Greek here. I know Usually my class is all Greek to you, but this is actually one case where it literally is Greek. So yes, the mu opioid receptor is one we're mainly talking about here. There's kappa and delta, not as germane to our discussion, um, not as important as far as the clinical effects and also some of the, the toxic effects we're going to be looking at. But uh, very, very important to know that, right? And they work on mu receptors, but how do they deal with pain? Like, how would you describe it to a patient? They're kind of working in the spinal cord and in the, in the brain to try to blunt that response to pain, right? So again, they're they're kind of inhibiting that signal from a painful site from being really transmitted up so that way you're not really that aware of it, right? It kind of blunts your awareness of that pain, right? That's how it produces that analgesia, okay? Um, so again, think about ways of like how you would describe it to someone who's a complete lay person who has no idea anything about medical stuff. Uh, and think about how you would describe it to them. Because if you can describe something very complex to someone who has no knowledge whatsoever, that really shows you, you, you really know something. So kind of think about these things kind of going forward. Because again, one of your biggest jobs is, is what? Patient education, absolutely. It's not the, the sexiest part of the job, but it is certainly one of the most important, right? Um, anyway, so moving into some more of our opioids we're talking about here, we have good old standard hydrocodone. This is a uh, very popular oral uh, opioid agent. And in fact, if you look at like the top 100 drug list very frequently, especially before it got shifted from a C3 to a C2, um, the exercise was the number one most prescribed drug in America, right? So again, no wonder we have an opioid epidemic when you're prescribing so much of this stuff, but really good for treating acute pain issues. Um, there's a couple of different forms that are out there. Uh, nowadays, we have actually have like an extended release preparation that's fine by itself, but typically you're going to find this in combination with the CDM so if you hear about Lortab, Lorset, Norco, um, those are the big ones. Um, those are the big brand names you'll see for hyd hydrocodone slash acetaminophen. And again, what's our limit for acetaminophen in a day typically? Like four grams, right? So again, think about all of the different sources of acetaminophen they're getting in through their intake, right? So again, if they're taking it outside of the Lortab, taking acetaminophen by itself and they're combining it to think about all that com in combination to make sure they're not going above that four grams. Now like in the hospital, it's nice because if you're prescribing both of these medications together, which could could happen, um, we actually have things like limits that will pop up. So that way if the nurse is trying to give a dose that would exceed that four gram limit, whatever the limit that we set in the computer, it'll actually pop up a warning is that, hey, you can't give any more of this today, right? But patients don't have that at home necessarily. So that you consider that, um, make sure you're educating this. Um, this one does have a little bit of that CYP2D6 uh, interference that could happen here. Remember we talked about ultra rapid metabolizers and slow metabolizers. Um, that being more of a big concern with things like codeine because codeine gets turned into what? Morphine. Into morphine, right? And again, morphine, very, very potent uh, analgesic. That was more of a concern there between codeine and morphine. Here you have a little bit of this and actually turns into another drug called hydromorphone, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. That's where we're going to get into our Dilaudid in a little bit. Have you ever heard of that, that brand name? But um, and again, some people don't respond great to hydrocodone. It could be because they're a slow metabolizer and they don't convert enough of it over to hydromorphone. That could be an issue, right? Or if it works really, really well, maybe too well in having toxicity, it could be because they're an ultra rapid metabolizer, right? So you want to think about those kind of interactions there. Um, but less clinically significant than with the codeine, which means that less people are going to really have much of a di difference here. So you don't have to really think about that as much when prescribing it. But if you have someone who's just really not responding well to it, that could be the reason why there, okay? Um, and again, why do you think we made it from a C3 to a C2? What do you think is the difference between those two schedules? It's more controlled, right? Because we, or the DEA has decided that there's more of an abuse potential with a drug, which is definitely a highly abused drug. Um, because there's more abuse potential to it, that's why they bumped it up to a C2, right? There's still an acceptable medical use. It's just more associated with abuse and, and, and um, you know, inappropriate use there. So, um, and again, how does that change how I can prescribe hydrocodone? What are my restrictions on it if I were a prescribing clinician? I can only do like hand or you know, actually like written prescriptions that have to be handed in. Uh, how many refills can I do it on? How for? Zero, right? What's the maximum that I can actually write for? How many days worth? 
that's important. That's actually a big distinction. We'll talk about the house bill a little bit later on, but there's actually some big, uh, some regulations associated with that. But say for instance, you're writing for chronic pain, non-acute pain, um, you could do up to a maximum of 90 days worth, but beyond that, they'd have to come back for more scripts, right? Um, anything else associated with that? Yeah, no refills is really the biggest thing and the, the day supply uh, is a big issue. We'll talk about other day supply issues in a little bit later. But this became a big problem, right? Because again, we find that opioids, not only are they good as analgesics, but what other kind of properties do they have? Could be good for Ashley right now. And you're coughing, right? Because it's an antitussive, right? We also have those opioid receptors that are responsible as an antitussive effect. I'm sorry, I used your 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 pain and suffering for a class, but I think it's a good a good illustrative point. So you'd have something called tussine X. That's another form of liquid hydrocodone with acetaminophen that we would get as an antitussive. Now all of a sudden, if you were going in for cough and getting this hydrocodone, it became much more difficult, right? Because again, there's more restrictions placed on it. You couldn't get you know refills on it, things like that. Um, another big problem we ran into is a lot of our patients who were um, you know coming out of say pediatric surgery. You know, a lot of times kids can't take tablets, so we have to give them liquid preparations. A lot of places didn't necessarily carry, carry a lot of these liquid preparations, which made it more difficult. And uh, if you just think about it, like, you know, if you were, say, a parent and your kid just had surgery and you call up a pharmacy and say, hey, do you have this hydrocodone liquid available? What do you think the pharmacist is going to tell you? Do they say, we're out of it, we don't have it? Or they'll say, I can't tell you that. And why do you think that is? Because they don't want to get robbed, right? They don't want people to come by their store and say, like, oh, well, you said you had a whole bunch of this stuff. Here's my gun. Give me your drugs. <clears throat> they think that's crazy that would never happen did i tell you about my second day working at cvs i got robbed at knife point right it's not nearly as you know as dangerous sounding as, as gunpoint but it was still very scary at the time right and they, that's what they wanted they wanted their hydrocodone they got two big bottle big 500 count bottles of hydrocodone and acetaminophen um so it happens right so those are things that you would and, and it was very tough because you have your kid who's in pain they just came out of surgery um and they you can't find the pain meds anywhere right so we had to make sure we had special agreements with pharmacies in our area to make sure that we had places they could go to to get their drugs but that was a big problem that moving to c2 is, is it made it more restrictive harder to find where they can actually get their meds at right so little things to think about there so hydrocodone is a big one. Oxycodone is going to be the other big one you're going to run into from an outpatient sort of uh, standpoint here. Um, anyone know a big brain name you run into for oxycodone? Oxycontin, right? Oxycontin, if you talk about the opioid epidemic, oxycontin is going to come up, right? Because what form is oxycontin in? Is it immediate release, extended release? It's an extended release preparation, right? So again, the idea is when it came out, they said, oh, this is great. It's an extended release preparation. It works for, you know, you don't have to take it twice a day. There's less addiction associated with this. And actually, if you're looking into the opioid epidemic, like a lot of the blame is actually placed on the manufacturers of Oxycontin because they were saying, hey, you know, you only have to give this twice a day. Works great. There's no addiction associated with these long acting forms. And what do we know about opioids and addiction? It can still happen, right? So again, and the other thing was, is that actually, if you look at the kinetics of it, a lot of patients were having issues where it was wearing off early. And that really what they should have been on is Q8 hour dosing instead of Q12. And when people are getting inact, you know, inadequate amounts of pain control, what do they do? They start to self-medicate. And what does that, can that lead to? Addiction, right? So again, that's one of those things that we had a big issue there. Um, but a lot of the marketing was all like, you just had Q12 hour dosing, Q12 hour dosing. They take these doctors out to these big lavish standards, give them golf uh, clubs, all these different things. And so that was a big problem. So if you look into this, some people are actually getting into some legal issues with that. I implore you to look at that stuff up. It's very interesting. but. Anyway, so um, it's available by itself, either as roxycodone, there's oxycontin, which is an extended release form, and then you have um, the combination with acetaminophen, which is like roxyset or percocet is what you normally see there. Uh, those are very common combinations you're going to find uh, out there as well. Um, this one, again, has a little bit of that CYP2D6 interactions, but not a big deal with this one as well. Um, and again, just know some people may not respond well to it. Some may, people may respond a little too well to it, but go into that kind of toxic sort of range there. Um, now, what is something that's important to tell people, like when they have like an extended release preparation drug? What do you want to tell them about taking it? Typically, you don't want to crush or chew the majority of those extended release preparations. What happens? You break the extended release nature of it, right? And in fact, in a lot of cases, you get all the drug out at one time. And so actually what you're finding with a lot of these new or extended release opioid preparations are actually trying to make it more difficult in order to get all that drug out at one time. So for instance, people used to be able to take um, Oxycontin and they would just crush it up, get a whole bunch of drug all at the same time, and they could either solubilize it and inject it or they can just swallow it, whatever the case may be. Um, but nowadays they actually make it so it's more difficult to where they actually will like, if you try to smash it, it'll kind of gel up until like it's kind of like hard candy almost looking thing. Um, so that way it makes it more difficult for people to get the drug out. Is that actually, 
you know, deter abuse. Some people find it pretty questionable, right? Some people are still going to find a way to get around that. But uh, just if you know, um, educate people, hey, if this next thing to release product, don't crush or chew it. And you can always look up that list there. Anyway, um, another good one here is hydromorphone or Dilaudid. If you hear someone call, talk about their Diliadad, that's usually what they're talking about. Um, and so this one is a very good, um, some people use it orally. A lot of people that will use the IVs. We use this quite often in the inpatient side of things. Um, very good agent. They're a little bit shorter half-life than morphine. You know, short, shorter half-lives are usually better for more acute sort of pain issues there. Um, and the other big thing is it's associated with less pruritus than, than morphine. And why did morphine cause a lot of that itching and, and nausea vomiting? A lot of the histamine release, right? So again, people who say they have a morphine intolerance, oftentimes, if it's not a true anaphylactic reaction, they can usually get hydromorphone. Even though they share a little bit of structural similarity, you get a lot less histamine release with this, and a lot of patients actually do pretty well with hydromorphone. Um, now again, you know, Dilaudid has kind of a kind of a stigma associated with being like, wow, it's Dilaudid, that's, that's way too much. Again, you can find equal potent doses of any of these drugs here, right? None of them are necessarily more evil than the other one. It's just a matter of what dose you're administering. And this one happens to be a lot more potent. So the doses you're giving are much smaller than you would see for something like, say, a morphine. And I'll show you uh, some examples of opioid conversions, but say, for instance, like, you know, two milligrams of morphine, maybe like half a milligram of Dilaudid. So you need to be comfortable with the different ranges you're going to be shooting for, uh, make sure you're not accidentally kind of going way too far one end or the other, either giving way too much or way too little, depending on the case. But a um, lot more growing use uh, I see with hydromorphone. Um, you see this a lot for, uh, I see a lot of like chronic patients, especially like sickle cell patients who end up being on oral Dilaudid um, on the outpatient side. And then that, when they come in, um, you know, you have to kind of think about, okay, well, what dose were they getting on the outside? How do I convert that for inpatient use? Because they're already tolerant, right? They already have, um, you know, they're not considered naive anymore. They're opioid tolerant. I need to consider what doses to give them, right? Anyway. Uh, and then we have fentanyl. Fentanyl is a big one. You hear a lot about fentanyl in the news. Where do you find a lot of fentanyl nowadays? In heroin, yeah. So actually you find a lot of uh, times that they are lacing a lot of heroin uh, with things like fentanyl. There's actually some other um, derivatives of fentanyl. So my dad's a CRNA and so obviously like I get a lot of my humor from him. So he's also a big nerd. Um, but he always talked about fentanyl and the, and the fentanyl family. So I always talk about Al, Sue, and Remy kind of the brothers and sisters of fentanyl. So I always think about that as the thinking about the different um, kind of derivatives here. But you see alfentanyl, sufentanyl, and remifentanyl, all the different varieties there. There's some other ones that are out there you may hear about, especially being laced on heroin, like carfentanyl is actually a very, very potent agent. Um, and a lot of times we're actually finding these are being shipped from out of the country into the US, and then people are lacing the heroin with these. And the benefit here is that it's super, super potent. So you don't need a whole lot of drug in order to get a really big effect out of it. Now, again, what's the problem with getting illicit drugs from Say some random dude on the you know corner of OBT and whatever the road. Do you know with dose strength they're gonna get so to be Exactly. Would you trust me to like make your drugs for you? Well you yeah. Maybe. <laughs> you just assume maybe I have some kind of quality control there, maybe I do some kind of testing to make sure every dose is exactly made the same, right? But the you know, the FDA is not monitoring me, right? If I'm doing uh, some clandestine drug manufacturing, but let's say some random dude or dudette you were getting some drugs from, would you necessarily trust them to get the dose right, right? Not necessarily, right? And it could not even be because they're trying to, you know, cheap you out on the, on the dose or something like that. They just may not be very good at making the drug itself, right? So again, if you find that, um, you know, you get a little bit extra fentanyl on this dose, but almost no fentanyl on this dose, you may find you get in some big trouble there, right? So some people, they would be using their normal dose of heroin, normal dose, and then they would end up dying from it because it was laced with fentanyl. They weren't used to having that potent of an opioid, and then they had the you know the, the negative effects, which we'll see in a little bit. So just be very careful with fentanyl. Fentanyl, you know, if you think about morphine being dosed in milligrams, about Dilaudid being more potent than that, maybe like a half milligram to a milligram. Uh, this is dosed in micrograms. Okay, so very very potent agent. It's important to make sure you're not getting that screwed up because if you try to give someone two milligrams of fentanyl, they will be dead. That's not good, right? It's a very, very potent drug here. And it's actually very, very good because it's a synthetic opioid, which means it actually shares no structure, uh, structural similarities with morphine. So if you had someone like a true anaphylactic allergy to morphine, you know, I'd be pretty cautious with actually giving them hydrocodone because there's a little bit of structural similarity there. But fentanyl is actually a great agent because it's fully synthetic. There should be no chance of cross reactivity. And so we oftentimes use this as an alternative. We use this a lot in surgery. Um, either that, like remifentanil, sufentanil, we see a lot used in the surgical realm for during the actual um, general anesthesia period. Um, very good drugs, right? One thing I will note, um, this is also good for like chronic use as well because we have some long acting formulations, things like transdermal formulations. So you see a TD there, it means transdermal. Anyone TM means? 
transmucosal. So actually, this is an example of a fentanyl lollipop. The oral transmucosal system here, where basically you just kind of suck on it. And so basically patients could titrate their dose based off of how their pain is. In a lot of pain, pop in the lollipop. If I'm out of pain, take out the lollipop. <laughs> Who might this be a potential uh, draw for? For children, right? They say, oh, <coughs> grandpa's sucking on that lollipop. It looks really good. <laughs> Let me get into that. And then they're dead, right? So... <laughs> Very, very potent stuff. Very important to make sure you keep this out of the, out of reach of, of children. And so if you think about like with the patches, when I take a patch off and I throw it in garbage, is all that drug out of that patch? No, there's still a lot of drug in that patch. And in fact, we've seen cases where kids will get into it. Either like the toddler will feed it to the baby or the kid will just grab it out the trash and eat it. Um, so you have to be really, really careful with that because then all of a sudden that, now they have a nice extended release preparation of the gut that's slowly leaching out. It can be very difficult to get out. Anyone know how we would actually kind of get that out of the GI tract? Hmm? Uh, so charcoal could be useful because it would actually have to bind up any drug that's leaching out. But how do you get that patch out of there? It's either got to go up or it's got to go out, right? So again, oftentimes we'll give them um, go lightly. We'll give them uh, go lightly, try to flush out the GI tract and try to get them to, to poop it out that way. Um, but yeah, so again, that's, that's something to be careful of. Um, other things to know as well with the patch, you do not want to apply heat to that. And what's a common non-pharmacologic therapy for pain? Heat, right? Heat pads and things like that. Or maybe I'm going to get into a jacuzzi. That nice heat is good on the muscles, the muscle aches that I'm having here, this low back pain that I'm experiencing. Um, when it interacts with that patch, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to speed up the dissolution of that drug going through the the, the skin. You're going to find it get, uh, some people have died from that as well, right? So again, do not apply heat to these patches because you will find increased effects from that, okay? Um, I think of any other good points to know. Oh, uh, one other thing to note as well, you have to be really careful when giving IV fentanyl too quickly. One of the big things you can know is you can actually develop what they call chest wall rigidity. Do you think that might be a problem? Of chest wall rigidity, I can't really oxygenate very well, right? I'm not gonna be able to ventilate very well. And so actually there's cases where you're trying to give this maybe before you intubate somebody, uh, all of a sudden their chest wall gets really rigid and you're not able to actually ventilate them pretty well. And in fact, the thing we have to do to reverse that is either give them a paralytic or we can actually give them some naloxone antagonists. So we'll talk about it a little bit later to actually reverse that effect. So that's one other thing to know. And again, that's usually when you're pushing the fentanyl too fast. Okay. Yeah, very good drug though. Um, up next we have methadone. What do we normally use methadone for? To take people off of their opioids, right? So we use this as a way to wean people off of opioids. Now, if you're trying to think of like an ideal weaning agent, what was some of the characteristics you look for? Want something like really short acting to so be out of the system really quick? No, because what could happen? They go into a withdrawal, right? We don't want to have those withdrawal effects because again, if people withdraw, what are they going to do? They're going to go find some more drugs to get into so that way they can try to deal with those withdrawal symptoms, right? Again, that's just, that's their physical urge at that point is to get more drugs in order to curb that withdrawal. So what we can do is try to give them a long acting medication to try to build up levels in the blood. So that way it's gonna have a very slow taper out of the system. So that way you can gently wean them off and hopefully prevent withdrawal from occurring here. And so this is where we have methadone. So methadone has a very long half-life and some people it can be greater than 50 hours. And so the nice benefit with this is we'd have these methadone clinics. I'm sure you've heard of methadone clinics before, where basically you'd have this kind of direct observed therapy where patients would come in Monday through Friday. And let me tell you what, they come in like clockwork. Monday morning at a methadone clinic is hopping, let me tell you what, because they'll take it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they build up blood levels, right? And then they go the weekend, the weekend uh, clinics close on the weekends. So hopefully they build up enough levels so that way they prevent withdrawal through the weekend. And then by the time Monday comes around, getting a little itchy, starting a little sniffly, tummy's grumbling a little bit, they need to get back into that methadone clinic because they need their dose like right now, okay? So that's kind of what they're, they're kind of shooting for and that prevents, hopefully prevents them from abusing other opioids outside of that. Now, again, is it a foolproof plan? Absolutely not, but again, that's the idea, right? And so anyway, um, so that's the nice benefit of having a nice long half-life here, right? And so we're actually finding though that it actually works pretty good for pain anyway. So we actually can use this as a long-acting medication uh, for pain. So instead of giving, say, uh, oxycodone and extended release preparation, the oxycontin, you can use methadone instead. That's an important distinction there. Again, the purpose and the intent of why you're writing that prescription can be important because if you're writing it for 
non-acute pain for chronic pain, um, you can do that as a provider. If you're like, signed up with a DEA, you can get away with that. It's no problem. If you're doing it for opioid addiction, you have to get actually a special exemption for that, right? So you need to be actually be a um, uh, you know addiction treatment specialist before you can actually write for opioid addiction, right? So that's kind of outside of your normal purview as, you know, say, if you're thinking from the ER, the family practice sort of standpoint there. So just something to consider there. Not everyone who is on methadone is a opioid addicted individual, right? Most of the time they usually have some chronic pain component to their, their history. Anyway, um, other nice thing about methadone, it actually has a little bit of norepinephrine reuptake inhibition. What do you think that might be good for? What kind of pain? <laughs> Like neuropathic pains are going to be the big thing. We'll talk about some of the antiepileptics and other drugs we can use for neuropathic pains, but that can kind of help out with that quite a bit. Um, so another thing to consider there. Um, one thing to note is that uh, this will prolong the QTC interval. So you have to be careful if you're combining this with other medications that can do that, so just be aware of that. Something fell from the ceiling there. <laughs> Hoping that wasn't a bat. Was just... Anyway. Um, <laughs> Piece of fluff from the ceiling. Um, anyway, so QTC prolongation is something to be aware of. So again, make sure if you have a high-risk patient, monitor for that if need be. Um, and again, oftentimes this can be kind of a sticky drug because um, you always want to make sure you double check what a patient's dose is before you're going to be prescribing this to them. I, mean, I probably mentioned the, the example where um, you know, a patient was coming to the hospital, they lied about the dose that they were receiving, no one double checked on the dose that they were supposed to be getting, they prescribed it on the inpatient side and they found the guy um, and you know, uh, very shallow breathing, not responding to, to painful stimuli. The next morning, had to reverse them with Narcan to wake them back up. Um, so you need to be very careful with methadone, okay? Uh, next, we have Demerol or Meperidine. Now, uh, I know a pain management specialist who called this Demonol. They really did not like Demerol. And that, in fact, there's uh, very limited cases you're going to use this, but some of you might be interested in surgery. And this is actually one of the places where you actually might find Demerol being used occasionally. Um, almost never used because of the fact that if you have patients with renal dysfunction, they will actually build up metabolites of this. It can actually lead to seizures, okay? So especially older patients, poor kidney function, they develop seizures from this. That's why we didn't like that. Um, also, it has a little bit of monoamine oxidase inhibition. So it means it would interact with things like SSRIs and other antidepressants. So a lot of problems with that. Uh, patients develop tolerance really quickly. So the, the analgesic effects weren't great because you'd end up having tolerance. You have to ramp up the dose pretty, uh, pretty rapidly compared to other drugs. Now, one thing we will do is actually use it for what we call rigors in a surgical setting. You know what rigors are? shivering essentially right um so we do this a lot in, in the post-surgical setting and they're waking up for anesthesia sometimes it'll develop a lot of that shivering um and so to try to calm the muscles down we'll give them some aparidine again i don't know the full mechanism for that maybe it has something to do with the kappa and the delta receptors who knows but just know that's what it's typically used for uh if you're seeing it used for pain you should question that you should be like eh, why are we using that not something else um i also see this from the emergency medicine standpoint if you have someone who has a for instance like a witness cardiac arrest what can you do to try to preserve myocardial tissue and cool them down. You know, uh, therapeutic hypothermia. Well, where does the body's response to being cold? You shiver, right? So actually, one of the problems is that the body wants to try to fight us, trying to cool down the body. So what we can actually do is give them a paradine, also give them like paralytics and things, and that actually prevents the the shivering from occurring. That keeps the muscles calm. And that way, they're not going to be kind of trying to raise their body heat up, right? So again, uh, very limited use case, but I mentioned it here just because you, if you go into surgery, you're probably going to say used occasionally. Okay, um, next we have buprenorphine, uh, suboxone, subutex are the common brand names you're going to see with that. Uh, another very long-acting agent. And the one thing that actually um, differentiates this from the other, other ones we've talked about is that they've all been full agonist. We've talked about so far. This one's actually going to be a partial agonist. So what do you think this might be good for? Mm, not pregnancy so much. Yeah, if you want to wean someone off of opioids, this is another very good drug for that. And so this is a more common thing. You won't really see this being used for pain like you would see methadone because it's only partial agonist. You're not really going to get full effects out of it from an analgesic standpoint. However, very good for helping patients get off of opioids. The benefit here is it's only partial agonist, so you're not going to kind of get the full euphoric effects that they're looking for. It also binds very tightly to that receptor. It's very, very potent in, in, in binding to that receptor and actually it has the tendency to kick other opioids off of that receptor. So what do you think could happen if that occurs? So say for instance, you know, you take methadone chronically as your opioid du jour, uh, and then all of a sudden I have buprenorphine come in and kick that methadone off the receptor, and now it's only, instead of having 100% activation, it's like only 50, with you go into withdrawal, right? And so you actually will see cases of this. I had one lady, um, EMS was calling and said, hey, we have a, a buprenorphine overdose via EMS. And I said, okay, 
based off of the side effects we're going to talk about, I know what that looks like. I can expect her to come in, be very sedate, very shallow breathing, maybe pinpoint pupils. This lady came in and looked like she had been abusing bath salts. Like she was basically fighting everyone. She, she was in four point restraint. She was spitting, kicking. And I was like, oh, this does not look like a buprenorphine overdose. So finally, we got her calm down a little bit where we get some history. And she's like, oh, I normally take methadone. And we're like, ah, that's it. Because she basically had run out of her methadone, decided to take her friend's suboxone and threw herself into withdrawal. So again, it's kind of an un typical, atypical sort of presentation for a buprenorphine overdose. They come in very agitated instead of very sedate like you would expect. So again, always try to get that history to try to make sense of what's going on there. So in fact, actually the, the big thing they will do with this is that, you know, the idea of when you want to initiate treatment with this. So imagine someone went to like a detox center or something. Um, when do you think you'd want to start the buprenorphine? So they did heroin the day before and now you're going to give them buprenorphine. Actually, what you want to do is have them abstain from any opioids. So once they're in the rehab center and then when they start to go in withdrawals before they really kind of get into the full throes of it as they start to go into it that's when you give the buprenorphine because that's going to take the edge off of it and then they can start treatment with that after that point that hopefully will help to prevent the withdrawal and then eventually they can wean the buprenorphine hopefully to off right so again that's kind of the goal with this one but just know if you were to give someone this drug immediately after using an opioid you can't throw them into withdrawal it's gonna be pretty bad uh, there's actually some uh, intramuscular forms you can administer like a depot sort of uh, drug that will last for several months. And again, they will tell patients beforehand, like, do not do any opioids for several days before you come in and get this in. Because if they do and they lie, and they get that intramuscular injection, is it really easy to get that drug back out? Nope, it is there. And they're going to just have to go through those withdrawals, right? And maybe get some benzos to calm down, but it's going to be bad, right? So there's definitely been some cases of that. Now, um, some of these forms, like Suboxone, actually comes in combination with Naloxone. And naloxone we talk, we're going to talk about as the antagonist to the opioids. And the reason why they do that is the idea is you want to prevent abuse by injecting the drug IV. Naloxone normally is not absorbed to the GI tract. So if you take it orally, only the buprenorphine makes it through. Everything's fine. If you try to inject it, the naloxone should kind of counteract the effects of the buprenorphine. Um, again, do you think it completely deters abuse? Now, people are going to do stuff anyway, right? So again, um, you'll still find patients who will abuse this IV. It's not preferred, but if that's all they can get a hold of, that's, that's what they're going to do. So in general, consider several different factors when trying to pick the right opioid for your patient here, right? So again, a lot of it's based on pain intensity, pharmacologic factors, coexisting condition, economics of it, right? So again, what can they afford? What do they have access to? Things like that. Um, and again, think about the intensity of it, right? So again, if I just come in, say, stub my toe, do I need hydromorphone for that? No, versus if I were to say, accidentally chop off my toe. Yeah, you can probably get some hydromorphone for that. You'll get a feel for it as far as kind of the, the hierarchy of opioids and see kind of like, okay, well, you know, when should I use oral versus IV? Typically, the more painful stuff, you want more potent agents, you want more um, more parenteral routes versus oral routes are better for more like kind of moderate, severe sort of pain there. But um, usually if you have persistent chronic pain, this is where you want to use a long-acting form in addition to a short-acting form. And what's the short-acting form for? Breakthrough pain, right? So again, you're using the chronic opioid, the long acting opioid to deal with the basal pain patients experiencing and then they use the as needed one for acute breakthrough pain okay so again you can see someone who's on oxycontin q8 q12 along with oxycodone immediate release every six hours is needed for breakthrough pain that is an okay combination even though it's the same drug you're like why am i doubling up here but that's the reason for it right because you want the long acting form to do with the basal pain you have the short acting one for the short, uh, the breakthrough pain. Okay, generally oral is going to be prefer, uh, preferred, right? Just from ease of uh, administration. Um, transdermal is only going to be good for chronic pain, right? That's not because again we said it takes time for it to get to the skin, takes time for it to work. Not going to be good for acute pain there. And oftentimes what we'll do is if we have patients who are like say in the hospital and they're on long term fentanyl infusions, we can actually convert them over to the transdermal form. So that way we can kind of wean them off transdermally instead of having to wean them off of the IV form, get the IV dc earlier, get them out of the hospital potentially a little bit quicker from that standpoint. And again, um, actually one of the things we do nowadays in the ER is actually a lot of intranasal fentanyl. Um, and so by administering this intranasally, it avoids us having to get an IV. And so for more, um, say like kind of quick procedures or, you know, maybe a little bit more moderate sort of pain issues, um, we'll go ahead and do a little intranasal fentanyl and it works very, very well from that standpoint. Um, Cause again, especially if you think about pediatrics, you know, do they like needles typically? Unless you got some really weird deranged kids, but typically, no, they do not like needles. Um, and so, you know, sticking some of their nose real quick and get a little spray is a little bit easier for them to stand than having to get an IV necessarily. So, um, and again, 
start low and go slow. You can always titrate up. You can always give more medications if you need to. Once they're in the system, though, it's hard to take it back, right? So again, think about it like a magic trick. If you don't want to start off by sawing the assistant in half, you start off with a rabbit being pulled out of your hat, right? Or maybe the, the infinite scarf, something like that. Not a great analogy, but that's all I got right now, okay? Um, now, oftentimes, you may find that opioid conversions are necessary. So why do I might need to convert opioids for a patient? What if you have, like, a chronic pain patient if you say, for instance, like sickle cell disease, right? So we have sickle cell anemia. Um, oftentimes, it will come into the ER for acute pain issues, like acute chest syndrome and things like that, um, and they get admitted. Well, they're on oral agents at home, but now they're coming in because those oral agents are not cutting anymore because they're in so much pain. You got to convert them over to IV. And again, are a lot of these drugs one-to-one -one conversions between IV to PO? And vice versa? No, right? Because you have to think about things like the bioavailability, right? Oral bioavailability could be a lot less than if you were just to give the drug IV, which IV is what percentage of bioavailability? 100%, right? Because again, all you're putting it right to the system there. So again, you have to think about things like that. You have to think about, you know, what's the formulary at the hospital? You may not have all the drugs on, on the market there because of, you know, cost considerations, right? Or maybe the drug's not working very well. Maybe they're having a lot of side effects associated with it. Maybe they get that, that rash and pruritus associated with, his, uh, with, with morphine and they switch to something else. So I'll show you some examples and I'm uh, just kind of keep this in mind that when converting these opioids, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Consult an expert if you need help, right? So again, call local pharmacists, call local pain management. Usually a lot of hospitals will have pain management um, uh, on staff that you can consult with uh, to try to help you out with that. Because again, the issue is you don't want to give accidentally too much because that can lead to toxic effects. You don't want to give too little because that leads to inadequate pain control, but also withdrawal potentially, right? So we want to make sure you be careful with that. And actually one thing we'll actually do when converting patients over is we worry about uh, having a, what we call an incomplete cross tolerance, which basically means that, you know, if they've been taking oxycodone for the past five years, they may not be, they may be very tolerant to that, but they may not be completely tolerant to say the effects of morphine. So usually we'll reduce the dose a little bit. So that way we can go ahead and see how they're going to respond to it. And if we need to give more, you can always give more. Okay. It's always a big thing with that. Just start low and go slow in these cases here. Okay. And again, include all sources of opioids. So if you have a patient who's taking, say, uh, extended release oxycodone throughout the day, and then they're taking as needed oxycodone and immediate release on top of that, you want to say, well, on average, how much of that immediate release are you using? How many times a day are you using it? And try to figure out then what their total daily amount is. And that way you can start off with that as your conversions. Okay. Now, again, um, just memorize this table for testing purposes. I'm just kidding. No, um, there's a lot of different ways that this can, can be done, right? So again, depending on where you work, they will probably have some kind of opioid conversion uh, available to you, or you can Google something like this and you can find information very quickly. Um, and again, my, my wife is a pain management specialist. And if you ask 10 different pain management people what the right conversion is, say for methadone to something else, you're going to get 10 different answers, right? A little bit of variations on the same thing, but in general, find a chart that works well for you and, and use that, right? And so basically what the golden rule is, is that whenever you're converting one opioid to another, you always want to convert it to oral morphine first. And so this is one of the things you'll see if you look in a lot of the pain literature nowadays. We talk about morphine milligram equivalents. That's basically, if you were to convert one drug to another, like basically the, by using morphine as our starting point, you can kind of use that to jump off to any other conversion from there on, right? And so that's typically what you'll do. So for instance, when looking at the different potencies here, and again, the more potent a drug is, the dose should be lower or higher should be lower, right? Because more potent, you need less drug to get the same effect. So for instance, if I'm looking here at the 24 hour daily dose, so say for instance, you know, a patient's taking say 20 milligrams of morphine, well, that's equal to about 13 milligrams of oxycodone. So oxycodone, you say is more or less potent. It's more potent, right? Okay. What about if I was say converting this over to say something like fentanyl or uh, alfentanyl here? 0.66 milligrams, let's convert that to micrograms. 0.66 milligrams is 660 micrograms, right? Just move the decimal place over three plus spots, right? Um, so again, be aware of those conversions there, right? And again, you may need to be able to do this. Um, if I were to ask you to do any kind of conversions on a test, I will give you very explicitly the different conversions there. It'll be very easy math. You won't need a calculator. Don't worry too much about it. I haven't run the test yet, so I don't know if I'm going to put any of those on there, but depends how nice you guys are to me overall. Just kidding. Um, yeah, but just be aware you need to convert it back to the more oral morphine uh, equivalent first, and then you can jump off from there to go to whatever else you need to, whether it be IV dilated, whether it be fentanyl, whether it be methadone, whatever the case may be. Okay.
just want to kind of get you some exposure to this stuff. So just as an example, let's look at this case. Say we have a guy named Jack Smith. He's got terminally uh, terminal lung cancer. A lot of pain associated with that. So he's on OxyContin, 40 milligrams every eight hours. And OxyContin, we said, is the extended release formation of oxycodone, right? And so we said, okay, well, we need to convert it over. Say he's going into hospice and we want to convert it over into parenteral or IV hydromorphone. How would we do that? Well, first off, we're going to start off with what the total daily dose is of that drug, right? So again, he's taking 40 milligrams three times a day. So we're getting a total of 120 milligrams of oxycodone. Then we said the golden rules, convert it back to morphine. So we said, okay, well, converting it to morphine, oral oxycodone is about 1.5 times more potent than morphine. So that means we just take that number 120 times it by 1.5, and you have 180 milligrams of oral morphine. So if I were to take that patient, I could convert them over essentially to 180 milligrams of morphine, and I should get the same analgesic effect for that patient. Okay? Make sense so far? Anyway, so moving on, then I can convert it to IV hydromorphone. So we say IV hydromorphone is 10 times more potent than oral morphine. So I would just take that 180, and I would just divide that by 10, and boom. Now the patient should be getting 18 milligrams of IV hydromorphone a day. Does that mean I just give them a big dose of 18 milligrams all at once, 9 o'clock in the morning? No, I'd probably be dead from that, right? Um, Again, this is palliative care, it's not euthanasia clinic, right? Um, so you'd spread that out throughout the day, right? You'd maybe give it either as a continuous infusion, maybe dividing up that 18 divided by 24 hours, maybe giving that as a slow infusion throughout the day. Maybe you're giving it as intermittent doses. You can do it a million different ways, right? But again, that's typically what we're doing is we're trying to figure out what our conversion is to what the daily amount is, and then you can divide it up from there, okay? Yes, sir? Do you count for, if these patients are long-term taking like this. Do you count for the tolerance factor over time? Like, I mean, if the patient, you know, I don't know, I don't know how long it takes to build tolerance. Maybe go like a week later, you'll jump mm. it to like 18, 25. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, um, and again, all of it is going to be based on how the patient responds. So, in that case, there, we talked about that incomplete cross tolerance. Maybe you drop them by, say, 25%, right? So, maybe you take 180, multiply by 0.75, drop a little bit, and see how they respond, right? Against a palliative care patient, right? They're into life. I'm not really too concerned about the toxicities here as much. Maybe I just start them off on that dose, right? They're especially in a lot of pain. So again, it depends on the patient, depends on a lot of different situations, how they respond to it. And again, you can know pretty immediately. You'll know within a few hours how they're responding to it. And then you can adjust your dose from there, essentially. Yeah. So again, uh, every patient is going to be a little different when it comes to that standpoint. Mm -hmm. Now, has anyone ever heard of a PCA before? It's a patient-controlled analgesia. What is this? It's a little button they can hit and they can say, oh, I need some extra morphine. Boop. And they hit the button and then a little extra morphine goes in and they feel better, right? That's essentially what it is, right? It's patient control analgesia. What's the benefit of doing that, do you think? Hmm? Less call bells than the nurse. Yeah, the nurse has to go in every five minutes. Yeah, actually, they find they use overall less opioids overall and the patient has some control over it, right? So again, patient only taking as needed instead of the nurse coming in every three hours. You in pain? Yep. Okay, here you go. Or like if you had that order that was morphine for pain one through 10 out of 10, come in, what's your pain? Oh, it's a two. All right, you're gonna get some morphine every three hours, every four hours, right? So again, that by doing that, by putting the patient into control of their own therapy a little bit, you will find that uh, overall the opioid usage actually goes down, which is great. Um, so again, the thing that this will do, and again, say usually an IV pump, we have administering. Sometimes we have other ways we can do this as well. We can sometimes do epidural infusions. We can do subcutaneous infusions potentially, but IV is the most common. So that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, and so basically it provides one, an hourly continuous rate. That's what we call our basal rate. This is kind of like the long acting version of it, right? Whereas again, we're going to be given the same dose every hour for 24 hours straight, right? For forever, essentially, until we stop the order, right? So again, this is our basal rate we're going to talk about. The other components we're going to talk about is actually what the patient is going to be administering to themselves. And so we can call that the on-demand dosing. That's kind of like using a short-acting form of the medication for breakthrough pain. Okay. And again, it's all the same drug. Now, if you think about it here, would you want to use like a really long-acting opioid or do you want to use kind of a short-acting opioid? Anytime you're giving continuous infusions of anything, whether it be insulin, whether it be pain meds, whether it be vasopressors, whatever the case may be, you want to use short-acting versions of the drug. Why, why is that? I can titrate it. I can titrate up or down very quickly, and I will see the responses to that. Because, again, how long does it take to get to steady state? Four to five half-lives. So if I use something really long-acting, like if I say we did something crazy like an IV methadone, PCA, it would be a long time for that patient to really ever gets a steady state. And it'll be a long time before I know if they're one getting full therapeutic effect and two if they're going to get really toxic on me. So by using a short acting medication, it's a general rule of thumb for any kind of continuous infusion, use a short acting drug. Okay. 
Just like when we talk about endocrine stuff, we'll talk about insulin. You don't want to use long-acting forms for a sub-Q pump. You want to use short-acting forms of insulin, okay? General rule for that. Anyway, so they're going to have the on-demand dose. You'll uh, prescribe how much dose of the dose they're going to get. And again, do you think as yourselves as PAs, you're going to be writing for PCAs very often? If you work in surgery, you're going to write for them all the time, right? Because again, these are the post-op orders the patients are going to be getting. Or you'll have a lot of patients who are, are on them. A lot of times, sometimes our anesthesiologists are the ones who will set up the PCA pump, and then you're the ones doing the follow-up orders to titrate them, right? To decide how much they need to get, they need more, if they need less. So if you work in surgery, you absolutely need to be familiar with these, okay? Um, so they have the on-demand dose, the other basal rate. Then they'll have what we call a lockout interval. Anyone know what that is based off the name? Yeah, it sets the minimum interval that they can give themselves another dose, right? So this could be 30 minutes, it could be 5 minutes, it could be 10 minutes, but basically it's the minimum amount of time between when they press that one button to get a dose before they can get the next dose. Now, what happens if the patient presses it in between then? They, nothing happens, right? Basically, they don't get any extra additional drug there. Um, so that's a, the lockout interval we're going to see with that. So in a typical order, you might see, for instance, if we use a morphine PCA, you'd have, a, say, a, for instance, a 1 milligram per hour basal rate, They'd have a 0.5 milligram demand dose they could use to give themselves that they were still in pain every 15 minutes. And so that means they can only get an additional four doses per hour of that. Make sense? Now, again, what might it tell you? And again, the, the machine will, will record every single button press that happens there. What do you think it means that the patient's pressing to say every 10 minutes? Probably their pain's not really being adequately treated, right? So in those cases there, you can actually titrate your dose up based off of how often they're actually having to use it. So for instance, you know, if I know they're hitting the button every 10 minutes and they're still not uh, being adequately served, well, what if I just try to bump it up? Say, for instance, I'm gonna say, instead of one milligram per hour, I'm gonna, let me bump it up, say 1.5. See how they respond to that. And now all of a sudden they're not hitting the button every 15 minutes, maybe they're hitting every 30. That gives me a better idea that yes, they're having adequate pain control at that point. Now we have a special case situation, say we're doing it in pediatrics and the nurse comes in, they're checking the records and the kid hit the button 386 times during that hour. What do you think that means? He's either in a lot of pain or he's just a kid and he's probably got ADHD and he's just hitting the button a whole bunch, right? Um, so sometimes you have to take it with a grain of salt. People get bored in this sometimes just you got nothing else to do but sit in bed and watch TV and then you can just hit the button a bunch. Um, so again, just kind of get through all aspects of that. Here's what the pump looks like. Um, typically, you're going to find these are locked because you don't want someone to run off with a big bag of fentanyl or, or morphine or something like that. The pump, uh, nurse will program in the, the pump settings based on what you prescribe and then they'll have a little patient button you can hit there uh, to give themselves additional doses. Now, what do you think are some of the requirements as far as a patient uh, from their mental status standpoint to use a PCA? Well, they need to be with it enough to actually know to hit the button, right? So again, do you think, uh, actually, I had someone actually ask me this yesterday. I'll tell you their profession, but they were like, well, what does the NICU use for their PCAs? And I go, they're babies. They can't hit the button. I said it much nicer than that, but that's kind of internally. <laughs> And again, it's very important to have a filter on yourself when you're responding to other people, especially if they don't know as much about a subject as you, that's okay. But internally, I was just like, they're, they're babies, they can't, they can't hit a button. <laughs> we finally went for my one-year-old's uh, doctor's appointment and the, the doctor was like, okay, well, how many words does she have? I was like, she's a baby, she has no words. She babbles a bunch. And, okay. I sat down, I was like, what do you write down? My baby's fine. <laughs> Can she respond to simple commands? No, she's a baby. If you yell at her, she'll get scared and cry, but that's about it. Anyway, um, I'm so frustrated with that appointment. But um, the patient has to be with it enough to actually be able to understand to hit the button, right? So, for instance, if someone is comatose, like they're not going to be able to hit that button, right? They can't administer it themselves. If they're too young, the mental status is not there, they're not going to be very good candidates for this, right? So, again, that's something you want to consider there. Um, but, again, the requirements for the actual order itself, and, again, you will get calls from the annoying pharmacist if you don't do this right, as one, you want to have the basal rate of the drug per hour. Now, can I set this at zero? I could, right? So if the patient is only, I only want them to get on-demand doses based off of what they're experiencing for pain, you can do that, right? So you can have a basal rate of zero, and that's, that's appropriate in some cases. They will then have the demand dose. You will then have a lockout interval, which is usually measured in minutes. So whether it be five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, 30, whatever you want it to be. Uh, and then you usually have a, a four hour maximum amount that they can receive. Again, who decided four hours? I don't know, maybe it has to do something with nursing documentation, but whatever, anywhere you go though, they'll say, okay, what's the four hour max? And you have to calculate that yourself manually. So um, again, I'm gonna give you a, a question on a test and then say, okay, well, this is the dose you wanna administer. You know, what's the four hour max that the patient could receive? And really it's just basic, simple math, right? You don't wanna overthink it here. But let's say for instance, I had a morphine IV PCA, basal rate is one milligram per hour. They're getting a demand dose of 0.5. 
and they get it a maximum of every 15 minutes. So what's my four hour, min uh, four hour maximum they're going to be receiving? Well, I know they're getting one milligram every hour, so that's four milligrams total for that four hours. And then I get the maximum number of basal uh, on-demand doses they can get, which would be how many? Yeah, so they, they get an on-demand dose every four times an hour times four hours. That's 16, right? So they get a total of 16 doses of 0.5 milligrams. Basically, do 16 times 0.5, you get a total of 8 milligrams of on-demand doses. So 8 plus 4 would be 12. So you can just work you through that one more time. So again, you're going to see that per hour, they get a maximum of four doses of 0.5 milligrams, right? So that means in one hour, what's the max they can receive of on-demand doses? Two milligrams, right? What are they getting as a basal rate? One milligram. So in an hour, what's the max they can get? Basal plus the on-demand dose, they get a total of three milligrams. So three milligrams every hour for four hours is 12 milligrams, okay? So again, the math is pretty simple. Just kind of run through it though, and if you kind of think about it from this standpoint, you know, it'll make sense for you eventually. But um, so again, that's helpful because that makes sure we can double check our, our math there to make sure that, okay, well, everything's making sense from the, what you want from the basal rate, what you want from the uh, on-demand doses, all of that. So that's something we have to call on pretty frequently. They don't actually match up and the, the provider's like, oh, I accidentally calculated that wrong. Let me redo it. Anyway, um, for uh, as far as the clinical pearls go with PCAs here, um, just know that uh, for especially for persistent pain, having a basal rate plus the on-demand dose tends to be most effective there. Um, and you may find that just having the actual patient controlled dose is better for um, more intermittent sort of pain issues, right? Um, so say for instance, you have someone going into labor, they have an epidural, that's actually set up as a PCA as well. Um, do you think you want a basal rate on that or just intermittent doses? Well, their baby's trying to come out, like that's a pretty painful procedure, right? That's kind of chronic in that sense, as long as they're in labor. So that's actually where you get actually get a, a basal rate. And then if they need additional doses on top of that, they can actually hit that, right? Um, so it's one thing you may see occasionally. But again, if it's a relatively minor procedure, maybe they're not in a ton of pain, um, maybe just on-demand doses all the patient needs, right? So again, very on a, much on a case-by-case -case basis. Typically, the on-demand dose is about a quarter to a third of the basal rate in most cases. Sometimes you go a little bit more than that, a little less than that. That's usually what you're going to see there. Um, and then you make adjustments based off of how often the patient's actually using it. Okay, so if they're hitting the dose every single 15 minutes, say in that previous example, again, 0.5 milligrams every single 15 minutes, very consistent, I might actually bump them up, say, to two milligrams as a basal rate and re uh, kind of reevaluate, or maybe bump them up two and a half or three and then reevaluate, okay? Again, they can always give a little bit more. It's hard to take it back. Okay. All right, let us continue on. So um, so we talked about the meds themselves. Now moving into, let me turn the microphone, uh, moving into the common and more kind of dangerous side effects associated with the opioids. Um, constipation is a big one. Almost every single patient is going to get constipated while on chronic opioids. Um, you're going to see nausea and vomiting associated with these. You're going to see a lot of sedation associated with these. So when you have a patient who gets first put on opioids, what do you tell them to do or not to do? Don't operate heavy machinery, you don't go driving a car, unless you know how like the drug's going to be affecting or they get kind of tolerant to those effects there. So just be aware of that. Histamine release is going to be worse with morphine and also related to morphine. Codeine, right? Because codeine gets turned into morphine. That one, you can see some histamine release associated with that as well, right? How can I treat that? Maybe an antihistamine like... Benadryl, or I could try using another opioid entirely, right? Again, if it's an anaphylactic reaction, I mean, they're actually responding to the actual structure of morphine, you have to be careful and maybe use something um, you know, like a fentanyl or something like a methadone that's like uh, structurally completely dissimilar. But if it's just a histamine reaction, you can give other opioids like hydromorphone, you can give hydrocodone, those are all going to be fine because morphine is really the worst one with that. Um, less frequently, you're going to find, you know, some patients will develop delirium, they get very kind of loopy while on these medications. Um, you can see risk of respiratory depression. Now, someone's going to die from an opioid overdose, or it's opioid use, where are they going to die from? The respiratory depression, right? That's the biggest thing we're really worried about with these patients here. Now, the risk is relatively low with normal dosing. However, if you have someone who's abusing it, if you have someone who's taking higher doses than normal, or once you start to mix it with other medications, it could also lead to synergistic respiratory, respiratory depression. That's where you're going to run into problems, right? So what other meds could you be combining here that could be a problem? Benzodiazepines are a big one, right? Because we use benzos as muscle relaxants a lot of the times or for sleep, right? So they're combining these with opioids. You're going to see some synergies in there, right? Other muscle relaxants can be a big one as well. Did I talk about oxysomonex before? 
Oxysomonex was a super common combination of drugs that saw people coming in on. Again, that's kind of a colloquial term we used in the ER there uh, for that. But patients who were coming in for an overdose usually had oxycodone. They had Soma, which is a muscle relaxant, uh, uh, Carisoprodol is a uh, generic name, and they had Xanax on board. Those three together, you're certainly going to see a lot of CNS and respiratory depression associated with that. And that's tough because we don't have reversal agents for every single one of those, as we'll see in just a little bit later. But um, normally, relatively low risk, which is normal dosing if you're using it by itself. Okay, And then we have the, the risk for abuse and diversion. And not every single patient is going to be at risk for this necessarily. A lot of it is going to be very dependent on the patient themselves. But when I say abuse, what does that mean? You know, it means they're using it inappropriately on themselves, right? Diversion means what? So, hey, look over there. It means they're going to be selling it to someone else, right? So, again, they will procure some and actually give it to other people. So, that's why if you think about it, like, you know, like pain management clinics, oftentimes they'll do urine drug screens to see if they're positive or not for the opioids you prescribe them. And at first I thought that was always crazy. It's like, well, of course they're taking it. They have chronic pain. Why wouldn't they be positive for the opioids you prescribe them? But they're selling it. They're not going to be positive, right? Again, maybe cocaine's their drug of choice, right? And so they're selling the opioids, then get cocaine or amphetamines or something like that. Um, now, if you think about like hospital personnel, are we, you know, immune from the risk of abuse and diversion? Absolutely not, right? We're people too. Who's, who do you think is most likely in the hospital to actually abuse these medications? Anesthesia is usually the most, the most prominent ones we end up running into, right? Because they have the easiest access to the drugs. Who do you think is the biggest uh, ones responsible for diversion? Actually, the pharmacy, right? Because we have access to the biggest amounts of drugs. So you actually see, find that more people with anesthesia are usually abusing them. People in pharmacy tend to be more likely to divert. Not from personal experience, but that's just what the stats show us, right? Um, now, does that mean that anyone else can't do it? No, of course not. I mean, you can have nurses that be abusing this stuff. You have all kinds of, all levels of providers. Uh, anyone who can get access to it could be potentially abusing these, these medications, right? Um, but just be aware those are things to kind of think about. So um, to minimize the adverse effects, obviously start low, go slow is always going to be the thing we talk about there. Um, and look at like why they're having the symptoms in the first place, right? You know, so if they're getting more constipated than what you would expect, like see if there's other medications that are also involved with that, right? Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, this is not to do with opioids necessarily, but um, what other kind of medications can frequently cause constipation? Got some channel blockers I heard is a big one. What else? Anti cholinergics are another big one, right? We talked about that causing the uh, peristalsis to almost stop completely in some cases. And so I had a kid who was being admitted for constipation and the provider reordered all their home meds. And sure enough, they were like on two or three different an anticholinergics. And I'm like, well, you know, it's probably drug related, right? But it's also related to all the behavioral issues they had. And so the person I was talking to was a GI practitioner. Like, I know it's probably related, but do you think a GI person is going to stop all their behavioral meds? No, they don't want to touch that stuff because, again, they don't want to get in trouble with that prescriber. It may cause deleterious effects to the patient. So oftentimes it's very difficult to kind of balance those out. But try to determine what the symptoms are. Um, and, again, if you can change the route or the regimen to something maybe, um, you know, something that may be able to help to mitigate some of those, that can be useful as well. Okay. Um, in some cases, the side effects are intolerable. You can try switching to a different opioid. So common ones, the histamine release of morphine, causing to switch over to something like an oxycodone or a fentanyl, something like that. And just be aware that um, tolerance to the side effects can develop over time. So again, the, um, the sedative effects, people get tolerant to that uh, over the course of several days. However, the constipation is always going to be around, right? They never really get um, tolerant to that effect. And that is going to require what we call mush and push. Do you remember what that means? What's the mush? A stool softener. What's the push? Stimulant laxative. Again, this is a heavy duty constipation we're dealing with. You have to use multimodal therapy here. So we're using a stool softener plus a, st a stimulant to try to encourage defecation. And so, what's a good example of a stool softener? Docolax or docusate is a good one. What's a good example of a stimulant? Senna is the most common one. So, you'll usually see uh, the two of those put together, and that will be a very good stimulant laxative uh, stool softener combination to get the mush and the push and try to deal with. That. And again, you'll have patients who, especially like these chronic pain patients who are maybe like in palliative care. And my wife tells me plenty of stories about this where you have these patients that are just, they're just in a lot of pain. Like it doesn't matter how much you try to maximize their opioids, they're just not dealing with it. And then all of a sudden you finally take a look at their bowel regimen and realize that hasn't been taken care of appropriately. Give them an enema, clear them out, and guess what? All their pain is like basically fixed essentially, right? Because again, a lot of times that abdominal pain, you can't just keep giving them opioids, it's just going to make it worse. Um, so really just never undervalue the, the, you know, the effect of a good poo can have on someone's quality of life. Okay. Very, very important.
my uh, infant. She's transitioning. And again, I hope they never listen to these videos, but she's transitioning from the normal, you know, kind of uh, very liquidy baby, you know, defecations over to a little bit more solid uh, stools because of the fact that she's switching her diet up, right? She's not entirely breastfed anymore. Um, but guess what comes along with that? A lot of constipation. So again, she'll go for like a whole day or two uh, where she's just cranky and upset and nothing you do is going to help her out. And then all of a sudden, the floodgates release and she feels a million times better, right? So always <laughs> consider that like, all right, someone constipated, deal with that first. And then all of a sudden you can deal with all the other issues uh, afterwards. Okay. Please don't ever tell her about this stuff. Maybe she'll be in PA school one day and she'll, I don't want her to listen to this. Anyway. Um, but again, other things you can do. Again, fiber, fluid is also going to be really important. Um, again, use uh, is good advice for anybody. Uh, and as I mentioned, that Senna plus a doc, you say is a very good combination. It gives you the stool softener plus the, the stimulant. It's going to be good. <laughs> now, normally, what did I say about stimulant laxatives? So if you'd like to avoid them or use them for short courses because of the fact that you get kind of dependent on those effects there, right? You can see like muscle atrophy around the the, um, uh, the intestines, things like that, because you're they don't really need to have that stimulation on their own, right? You're kind of getting the outside sources. So again, it's, it's a double-edged sword in those cases there to kind of balance that effect versus the constipating effects of the opioids. Maybe using stool softeners all the time, maybe, you know, the, the stimulants only every once in a while, but typically this is what you kind of have to rely on in these, uh, these cases. Other laxatives can be useful as well. You know, if you need to give them an enema every occasionally, uh, if you need to give them something like a polyethylene glycol, like a Miralax, that can be useful as well um, to give just an additional kind of um, push to try to get things moving into the GI tract. Anyway, um, up next we have the opioid antagonist. Uh, the most common one you're going to run into is going to be naloxone or Narcan. So what we're uh, is used for like kind of emergency reversal of, of opioid overdoses, right? And so basically these are just a mu opioid receptor antagonist. You're going to kick that drug off of the receptor and then not activate it, right? Because it's an antagonist. It's not going to have any activation of those receptors. Now, what do you think is the most common side effect you see with Narcan? Withdrawal is the biggest one. Has anyone ever seen a Narcan withdrawal or a Narcan reversal? Can you describe it? Huh? Say it again. It's like, say, it's like an exorcism, right? So if you've ever seen the exorcist, that is essentially what it is like. Do you have a personal anecdote? For the first time I put Narcan, I was in uh, P4 precept and uh, So that, that illustrates several very good points about Narcan. All in one, <laughs> succinct story. Thank you for that. It's a great teaching opportunity. So what do we know about that? One, the dose actually really matters when you're administering this. So say, for instance, if you're given 0.2 milligrams, that might be enough to kind of start to kind of wake them up a little bit, but sometimes you can't rely on that. They're, they're cyanotic and you need to get them reversed immediately. Like you got to give full doses, right? So again, and oftentimes it can actually depend on what opioid they receive. So as I mentioned, buprenorphine binds really tightly to that receptor. So it takes a lot more Narcan to kick that off of there versus something that like morphine responds much better to it. And in fact, what you actually found was depending on where you practice, you actually use different Narcan doses. So for instance, if you're up in New York City, this is like several years ago, uh, if you're say up in New York City um, and you were working there, there's a lot more heroin use than what we had down here was a lot more prescription opioid abuse. Our prescription opioids are a little bit harder to reverse. So up there, you'd be giving micrograms of, fent or of uh, Narcan to try to reverse them without throwing them into withdrawal. Down here, we'd have to give up to like 10 milligrams in some cases, right? So uh, the dose really doesn't matter in a lot of those cases. But the biggest side effect is the withdrawal you're going to put them into, okay? Ideally, you want to give them just a small enough dose where they kind of... Now, do they need to be awake even? No, these people usually don't want them to be awake, right? What do you want them to be doing at least? breathing right you want them to at least be able to respond to some sort of verbal stimuli but if they're sleeping that's fine with me as long as they are breathing that's the biggest thing so and oftentimes if you give the right dose what do they start doing they should start yawning why do they start yawning because you're actually waking up the brain stem a little bit and it's actually responding to a lot of co2 they're building up and that's what causes them to yawn and try to breathe some of that off and in fact what we can actually do is do entitled co2 monitoring and that's a very useful way to determine if they're actually retaining a lot of that because um, you can look at their respiratory rate and it may not maybe even misleading. They could have a relatively normal respiratory rate, but they're not they're breathing very shallowly, right? So they're not going to be blowing off a lot of CO2. Give them a little bit of Narcan, that will start to wake them up. They'll start to yawn. You'll see that CO2 start to come back down, right, to normal ranges there. 
So uh, that's very important. Thing. I remember one story kind of similar to that where we came on for rounds in the ER at seven o'clock in the morning and we had the environmental people that were in and they were just like basically, you know, doing like a full terminal cleanup of this room that this patient was in. They're like, oh, what happened in there? And like, oh, I had this patient overdose on opioid and I gave them a dose of Narcan. Um, and they're like, okay, well, you know, what happened after that? It's like, well, they didn't really have a good enough response. So I gave them another full dose of Narcan and then they have what they call a code brown. <coughs> Everything wakes up in the GI tract and it's going to come out of both ends in some cases there. So that did, the patient not actually do a full cleanup because it was just such a big mess. So again, be very careful with Narcan. You can always give a little bit more. You can't necessarily take it back. Now, the other good point with that story was is that the patient fell right back asleep afterwards. So what does that tell you about the duration of action of Narcan? Very, very short. Within 20, 30 minutes, the drug is basically out of the system. Okay. Maybe enough for some drugs, but a lot of them have a lot longer half-lives than just 30 minutes. And so the patient tend to have a resedation that occurs there. So you need to be able to be able to give more doses if you need to. We have a lot of different routes that are available. Oral is not going to work for these patients because it does not have any kind of good bioavailability from this standpoint. But we can do IV, we can do IM, and intranasal is becoming a more important route nowadays, especially since we're moving more towards um, trying to recommend co-prescribing of uh, Narcan along with especially more chronic pain patients, patients with bigger doses of opioids um, to have at home. And so there's a couple different forms that are out there. There's an intranasal form they can administer to themselves, or not to themselves, someone else could administer to them because usually patients are too sedate to do it. Um, or they even have something like this, which is an auto injector. This is kind of like the EpiPen of Naloxone, essentially, where you actually, once you pull out the little stopper on top, it actually talks to you. Uh, if you come by my office, I have a few dummy um, units you can actually uh, listen to, it, and it'll tell you actually how to administer it uh, intramuscularly. But uh, just know that we're kind of, there's more of a push to co-prescribe naloxone with a lot of these big dose opioids. That way, someone at the home could administer to them to hopefully prevent potentially death. Right? We're seeing a lot of people actually dying out in the field in these cases. There. <laughs> Say it again. Yeah, so that's the other big push as well, is we're seeing a lot more first responders actually uh, carrying naloxone. So before you think first responders, you think EMS, certainly. Um, but oftentimes, cops are showing up before then, right? So by the cops having access to it, they're actually, uh, and again, Orange County several years ago had a big push to all, all the cops to start carrying that, uh, which is great. Right, and so now we're trying to get more people just to carry the uh, more lay people. And in fact, there is a, um, a standing order from the Surgeon General of Florida that says that you can just, you as a provider, or use anybody really can go up to a pharmacy and say, Hey, I want a dose of naloxone and they can sell it to you. Basically you're the patient on the prescription and the provider is the surgeon general and they can do that. It's a standing order now. The pharmacist might know about it. Actually, I talked to a pharmacist yesterday who works retail and he had no idea about it. I was like, Oh yeah, you can definitely do that. Um, but, uh, yeah, so again, we're trying to increase the access to it. And actually the FDA is moving to move, uh, naloxone over the counter. So again, that could be one thing we may see down the road where you can just go up to the CVS, Walgreens, just pick it up, no problem, and have access to it, right? Because again, just having access could potentially save someone's life, okay? But they need to make sure they call 911 after they administer a dose because if they give it to them, patient wakes up, they may reach the date again. And if you only had that one dose, then you're kind of out of luck at that point. So, uh, but again, there's a lot of fear of calling 911. They feel like they're going to get legal trouble. So there's a lot of, a lot of barriers to it. But just know um, that it's a relatively short-acting drug. These would usually be given either parenterally or intranasally, um, and withdrawal is the biggest side effect. Are there really any other, any other side effects associated with it? Zero. That's why they want to make it over the counter, because if you're an opioid naive patient, I can give you uh, a bath and not, naloxone and nothing would happen to you, right? If you're opioid tolerant, though, withdrawal is the biggest thing you, you worry about, okay? Anyway, um, there are a few peripherally acting opioid antagonists that are out there, these basically cannot cross the blood brain barrier. So they are good for patients who are chronically on, on opioids for analgesia, but they're really stopped up, right? The constipation is really bad. They could have an ileus associated with this. And so what we can do is use these ones that work peripherally to wake up the GI tract by working on those mu receptors in the GI tract to stimulate peristalsis while leaving the brain and the spinal cord unaffected. And so we have things like alvimapan, we have methyl naltrexone, and this naloxagol are the three big ones. I see this most commonly in like the post-operative setting where you're trying to um, stimulate the bowels so that way patients can, uh, once they start passing gas, having, uh, having stools, they can uh, potentially get out of the hospital that much quicker, right? They may still need the opioids for pain control, but you wanna make sure their uh, GI tract is waking up. And so you'll see that occasionally. Okay. So any question about the opioids or Narcan or anything like that? If you get a chance to see a Narcan reversal, it is very exciting. I recommend everyone get to see it at least once. There's a good, uh, there's a movie. I've not actually seen the full movie, but there's a, it's uh, Nicholas Cage is in. It. I think it's called Bringing Out the Dead. He's a, uh, he's an EMT, um, and they have a whole scene where they do a Narcan reversal, and it is very true to form. Actually, what happens in, in real life. So I recommend watching that. You should Google Bringing Out the Dead Narcan, and you'll see that. Anyway, uh, very funny scene. But so. Um, 
in addition to opioids, because we said opioids are not always the answer, you want to have these other adjuvant medications that are useful, especially for neuropathic pain. Opioids are not usually going to be first line for neuropathic pain. They can be useful in some cases, more severe cases, but uh, things like anticonvulsants, things like lidocaine, which we consider to be a local anesthetic, can be very useful here, and things like tricyclic antidepressants. And again, you're in pretty, a lot of variability in what patients are responding to, but we're going to go cover these and we'll kind of see where, where they fall into place. So just other ones we can run into, things like uh, antiepileptics and antidepressants. Um, anxiety medications can be important here. We'll see if these can either be used as a like muscle relaxants, but also just have a lot of anxiety associated with pain. This can kind of help to deal with that, much like we talked about anxiety being associated with nausea and vomiting, same thing there. Um, corticosteroids, uh, botulinum toxin, what do you think that's good for? We talked about one case for its use. There are migraines. We talked about migraines being induced by uh, having that kind of the increased muscle tension. You can paralyze those muscles and try to loosen those up potentially. Um, other things, medical marijuana, we'll talk a little bit about that here. Uh, tramadol, capsaicin, so these are some of the things we're going to talk about in a little more detail. So, um, as I mentioned, antiepileptics are very good for neuropathic pain states. Um, various ones can be used, carbamazepine, gabapentin, lamotrigine. We talked about all these already, right? Be able to refer back to those. Again, what are common side effects of antiepileptics? CNS depression is the most common thing, right? So again, think about what other medications you're gonna be prescribing along with this. They're on opioids as well. Both of those can be C, uh, CNS depressing. Um, and uh, other things, obviously, you know, the dermatologic manifestations, et cetera, but the sedation and the ataxia and all that's gonna be the biggest thing you're gonna see with that. Tricyclic antidepressants, these are good. You mainly want to focus on things that are blocking norepinephrine reuptake. We don't really care about the serotonin aspect of it so much. So in this case, you could also see things like um, uh, duloxetine and venlafaxine and things like that. The SNRIs could also be used here as well. Um, what do you think is a big benefit of using like an SNRI versus say like a tricyclic antidepressant like amitriptyline? A lot more specific for treating just that norepinephrine reuptake uh, inhibitor as far as this mechanism goes. Remember, tricyclic antidepressants have a lot of sedation associated with it, all the anticholinergic side effects. Imagine putting a TCA along with an opioid. That constipation is going to get 10 times worse than it was before, right? So again, think about the different mechanisms here and what's going to happen. Um, if they have underlying depression that needs to be treated, this could also be another good case for, for use of something like TCA or an SNRI. Um, but just be aware of the you know, sexual dysfunction, the weight gain, et cetera, seen with these drugs. Uh, local anesthetics can be very, very useful. In fact, um, they can either be used uh, topically. So we have things like lido, uh, lidoderm patches, which can be applied. These are good for neuropathic pains like postherpetic neuralgias, things like that. Um, we also see a lot of uh, either epidural <coughs> nerve blocks are good. So again, based on where the drug is actually traveling up through the spinal cord, you can find you have regional anesthesia that is done here. So normally you think about things like labor and delivery using this epidurals for women in labor to try to try to numb up the lower portion of the body a little bit to try to deal with some of that pain there. Um, and then in some cases, you may be able to do more local blocks, right? So you may be able to, if you have, say, for instance, orthopedic surgery, you replace a knee, you only want to apply local anesthetic to that area to try to numb up that. It has a lot of opioid reducing effects. Now, we talked about local anesthetics, I think, briefly. How do they work? Anyone remember? Remember lidocaine we talked about in terms of what what um, condition? How, how do we use it before? Is an anti a Rhythmic, right? We're using the antiarrhythmic. Remember what it did? There's a 1B antiarrhythmic block sodium channels, right? This is doing the same thing for the nerves, right? So if I block sodium channels, what happens to the action potential? Cannot propagate, cannot travel from the area of pain up to the spinal cord, up to the brain, okay? So again, that's why you're numbing up the areas because those signals don't get transmitted. They still feel a bit of pressure, but the actual pain signals are very much dead there. Okay, so um, we can do this for several different cases. We have things like Imla cream, and which is basically a combination of lidocaine and prilocaine. Um, by mixing those together, those are good for things like needle stick analgesia. So if you have someone who's really worried about the pain associated with the needle stick getting an IV, we will use this quite frequently. We have a lot of patients who have uh, implanted ports because they need constant uh, central access. We will uh, uh, you know, put that on beforehand to try to make sure when we're accessing that, it's not so painful. And then, um, as I mentioned, you can do like the, the local nerve blocks and things like that to try to reduce the total amount of opioids these patients need to receive, okay? We'll talk more about these in the surgical um, uh, section a little bit later on. I just kind of want to get you starting to think about these um, as being a good adjuvant, a kind of helping agent uh, on top of uh, other, uh, other medications used for pain. Okay, getting into the skeletal muscle relaxants, um, we have a lot of different options here for things like baclofen, cyclobenzaprine, metaxalone, methocarbamol, tizanidine. Um, they all work virtually identically. Um, 
And these are good for patients who are having like muscle spasms is, is one of the causes of pain. Again, these are very commonly prescribed along with opioids for musculoskeletal pain. Again, the dangerous combination, right? Especially if, you're not, if they're naive to both drugs, a lot of sedation associated with these. Essentially what they're doing though is they're working on the GABA B receptors. If you remember, what did we talk about working on GABA A receptors? Benzodiazepines, right? That's how they treat seizures. That's how they're going to work as a muscle relaxant in some degree. It's how they work on for sedation. They hyperpolarize those neurons. GABA B is going to have a little bit different distribution. These don't work for seizures, but they work to help kind of relax the muscles to some degree. You will still see some CNS slowing, though, uh, related to this. But basically, they're hyperpolarizing these nociceptive fibers. Um, they're trying to uh, hyperpolarize the signals to the muscles. That way, they're not as tense not spasming, not causing pain associated with that. Um, again, they interrupt that kind of pain, spasm, pain cycle, uh, I think I've mentioned before, where again, when you have a bit of pain, what do you reflexively do when you have that pain? Tend tense up, right? And so that leads to a worse spasm, which leads to worse in pain. So by interrupting that a little bit, you can help to deal with that, that cycle there and, and, and help with that. Um, very good for helping to regain function, helping especially like in conjunction with things like PT and OT, um, try to get, uh, get patients back to normal a little bit. But again, a lot of fatigue, a lot of sedation associated with these. So be very careful mixing them with alcohol, careful mixing with other opioids, with benzos. Very, very common though. I will see all three of those combinations coming in. Actually, all four of those alcohol, opioids, benzos, and, and these, and profound CNS depression to the point where we need to intubate these patients, otherwise they're not going to be breathing anymore, right? Uh, capsaicin. Where do we find capsaicin? We all got to enjoy some capsaicin at uh, the chili cook-off, right? Find some chili peppers is what makes it spicy. Anyone remember the scale we use for spiciness? Scovilles is actually the scale we use for that. But yeah, so this is the same stuff essentially. Um, now, has anyone ever like you know chopped up jalapenos and like gotten it on their in their eyes or on their skin? What does it feel like? Hot. It's not fun. And again, anytime I'm chopping up jalapenos, my eyes instinctively start to itch, and my fingers just instinctively want to go there and I have to like pull myself back, otherwise I'm just gonna just jam right in there because I don't know why that happens, but it always always happens. So same thing happens with capsaicin topical products. Essentially, they're working by uh, depleting substance P. What causes that warmth and that heat and that pain is that substance P being released and trying to activate those nociceptive fibers. If I can give something that causes that release chronically to deplete those nerve endings of that substance P, you get, decrease the pain essentially, right? There's less of it around to actually work. So what do you think that means as far as administering it? Well, you've got to be consistent with it. You have to use it consistently. Otherwise, you're going to find that as soon as you stop using it, what happens? Substance P builds back up and it's able to trigger off those fibers again. Okay. Now, again, so compliance is going to be a big issue with this. A lot of people find this to be very effective if they use it appropriately. Most people don't use it appropriately and they'll stop early. Um, either they find it um, you know, kind of irritating to have to use it itself. But again, let them know that pain is going to go away with time. You know, it's pretty minor in comparison to whatever pain you're actually trying to treat usually. Um, and if they stop using it, it's going to come right back, right? The, the, you have to start all over as far as the desensitization sort of process there. So just be aware of that. Um, again, the stuff will burn just like anything else, just like a, you know, a jalapeno will if you get it in your eyes, and mucous membranes, anything like that. And you know the best way to treat, you know, say for instance, you actually got on, the, say, a mucous membrane, the best way to treat that? No, why, why milk? It has fats in it, right? So again, you don't want to use your skim milk, you want to use the full fat milk because it can well, allow that uh, capsaicin. It's very lipophilic, it'll partition over into the fat and then can help treat it. Olive oil works. Uh, anything that's fatty it can potentially work here. So um, I remember I had one call from the poison center. This lady calls up and she said she was um, uh, cutting up some some jalapenos and like her, you know, basically her, her skin was starting to like turn purple. It was like burning so bad. She was having such a bad reaction to it. Um, and I was like, well, put some olive oil on it. You have some of that in the house? She's like, what is that going to do? I called the poison center. You told me to put olive oil on this thing. It's burning it. And I was like, just do it. Call her 10 minutes later. She's like, ah, oh, I feel so much better. And it's amazing. And I was like, see, we know what we know stuff every once in a while. Um, for eye exposures, though, I would not recommend pouring milk or olive oil into the eye. <laughs> Uh, in those cases, just a lot of flushing with tap water is going to be fine in those cases, which can be tough if you're doing like a, a child or something like that. You know, how, how do you flush out a kid's eyes? Like if they're fighting you, what do you got to do? Huh? Pry their eyes open underwater. Just pry their eyes open underwater. If they're <laughs> kicking and fighting you, obviously never wrestled with a toddler before. Um, we, have to, we have to basically put them into a burrito. So we have to call them a papoose. We basically take a, a, a that's what it's called, uh, take a, a blanket or something, just wrap them up as tight as you can, and then just jam them under there, and that way they can't fight you as bad. It sounds horrific, and it's probably scarring to everyone involved, but it's, it's what you gotta do sometimes. I remember we had one kid who, um, 
they were again this is in duval county right so again these are not the the most um you know iqs tend to run a little, a little lower there um <laughs> listen, i'm from that area i know i can speak to that but um so we had these two kids who were playing out and again this is out like on the west side of duval so again these are kids like you know playing out the trailer park they, had, they didn't really have any access to good toys to play with so they had an empty bottle of drano that they had and they said let's toss this back and forth not a great idea because then the cap came off drano came out and got into one of the kids eyes right so very very irritating very caustic um so he got rushed over to the pzr and we had to treat him but this kid's fighting us he's screaming bloody murder how are we going to deal with this kid? Well, actually, using a little bit of ketamine. Ketamine was able to knock him out enough to where he was basically uh, very calm. He's laying there. He's very sedated. And we can put the Morgan's lens in and then get that uh, eye flushed out, right? So sometimes you use chemical means. Sometimes you got to use physical means, depending on what the case may be. But um, anyway, when you're using stuff, either use gloves or have the patient make sure they really wash their hands very well. Now, is just tap water going to be good enough? Soap and water, right? Because soap is going to be able to work as, uh, uh, as a detergent. It's going to be able to get rid of that that lipophilic substance. Otherwise you may find it still on, sitting there on the fingers and then they go to wipe their eyes a few minutes later and it's still gonna burn. So soap and water is really important to use there, not just tap water. Okay, uh, next we have tramadol. And tramadol you probably fit in along with uh, the opioids. It's a partial agonist at the opioid receptors, but it's pretty wimpy as far as, as, as potency goes compared to some of these other agents. The other big benefit here is it blocks reuptake of norepinephrine, which means it's good for what kind of pain? neuropathic pain, right? So you see a lot of patients like fibromyalgia and other kind of pain conditions are more neuropathic in nature, respond fairly well to tramadol here. And for a long time, providers like nurse practitioners and PAs in Florida would write for this all the time because it used to be a non-controlled substance. However, they still realized that there was a, some abuse potential with it. So they ended up bumping it up. And so now it's a C4. It's not really a problem in Florida so much anymore, as long as you got your DA license, you guys can still prescribe for it now. But back in the day, it used to be, it was kind of a big issue because that was one of your, um, you know, kind of your go-to guns there. You didn't have access to it anymore. But um, so it can be okay. Be aware though, they can cause seizures, especially in patients with renal dysfunction. One thing you do want to note there. Um, and then again, it's another good one. You're going to see in combination with uh, Tylenol pretty often, so it's got ultra set, it's a common combination there. Um, but just be aware of the, you know, you can see common uh, somnolence, you can see constipation, all the normal opioid side effects still apply here. It's just usually a little bit less severe than you would see with, like I say, a full opioid agonist. Okay. Okay. And then talking about medical marijuana. So can you guys prescribe medical marijuana when you get out? Not technically. Actually, I was looking up the laws for this. This is part of my FAPA talk. Um, I was looking up the laws re regarding PAs prescribing in, in uh, controlled substances in Florida and does not cover medical marijuana, unfortunately. So, but you're still going to see patients on it. So you need to be at least familiar with it. Um, and again, the two main psychoactive component, or I guess the two main components of, of you think of marijuana is what? THC, CBD, right? Cannabidiol, CBD, and then tetrahydrocannabinol, right? Um, and so again, depending on the different disease states you're dealing with, you may want to focus more on one than another. So for instance, CBD is really good for a lot of neurologic conditions. So if you have something like um, seizure disorders being treated, usually CBD is the thing you're going to go with, right? THC is usually the other component we're looking at if we're looking at it as maybe like a, um, an appetite stimulant, usually for some of these pain conditions, THC tends to be a little bit more focused on here. But um, basically the law passed in 2016 in Florida that it could be used. And again, looking at the list, there's lots of different things you could use it for, right? Now, technically, you guys all qualify for PTSD after you get out of school, um, so you can all get your green cards, no problem. But things like, um, you know, it's good to put the caveat at the end of this, any other debilitating condition, blah, 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 basically anything you think that could benefit from medical marijuana, you can prescribe it for that, right? So that kind of gives you a little bit of leeway there in the law uh, to where if you feel like there could be a good candidate, you go for it. Now, as I mentioned, um, two big components are CBD and the THC. Now, again, if you were to take a urine drug screen, what are they actually looking for? THC. Does that mean if you're using CBD products, you will never show positive? I can't say that for sure, right? Because again, this is not being regulated through the FDA. So I don't know necessarily what the manufacturing processes are like. There's a lot of different uh, dealers that are out there, reputable and disreputable. They could say it's all CBD, but unless you do the GC mass spec yourself, you may not know. Um, so again, it's one of those things where you know, let patients know if they're just taking a CBD product, you're kind of taking a gamble there. If you need to take a drug screen, be aware of that. However, if they have their, you know, the medical marijuana card, um, they, they're good at that same point. It should be it for, for most jobs. Anyway, um, there's two main receptors we're going to focus on, CB1 and CB2. CB1 is the main one we're going to be looking at. Uh, this is the primary one in the, in the CNS, um, usually responsible for a lot of the, the euphoric sort of effects and, and all the kind of the, the big effects we're looking for here. And again, the, the actual neurotransmitter activity is, it gets very complex. We don't know the full scope of it, but we do know they're working on these CB receptors. 
So um, what is the risk of using marijuana? No risk at all? This is perfect. You should use it for everybody. Are there any risks? It's a gateway drug. Huh? It's a gateway. It's a gateway drug. Everyone's going to be injecting heroin after using marijuana, right? No, that's not the case. <laughs> what, are some, what are some risks, though? Huh? Yeah, so you get that uh, cyclical vomiting sort of phenomenon. It's usually see more like chronic patients, uh, certainly. What are, what are acute things can you see? Impaired attention, should I go driving? No, because again, you can still get arrested for being under the influence, right? Because again, your reaction times are slowed. Uh, memory impairment associated with it. So again, there's, it's very safe. But not completely, you know, not without its own own risk there, right? Um, chronically, again, we still need to figure out what the chronic effects are going to be here. Some people are concerned about memory impairment. Some people are concerned about uh, IQ drops, uh, things like that. But um, that's uh, not really fully known. Just be aware, some people as well don't really respond well to this. You can have exacerbation of their depression, their anxiety, things like that. Some people get really paranoid uh, on uh, marijuana. So it just depends on, on the patient, right? And again, the other big thing is it goes into the dosage form as well. So what are different ways you could actually have access to or have uh, had the marijuana be administered. Two most common ones, inhaled or oral. So again, you being competent practitioners are going to know all about the kinetics of these things. So you can talk to people intelligently about this. Which one do you think has a faster onset? Inhaled, obviously, because again, it's right there in the lungs. It gets absorbed right, goes right back to the heart, right to the brain. So it works very fast. Which one do you think has better bioavailability? Inhale probably as well, right? Because again, you don't have to go through the liver. You bypass that first pass effect there. Um, but think about things that they're smoking something, right? So again, not using like a vaping uh, device, but actually smoking. Um, you know, those hot gases and all those different things you're, you're pyrolyzing can also be dangerous though, right? So you can see exacerbations of bronchitis and asthma, things like that. Maybe not great for them uh, from a respiratory standpoint. So typically you avoid a lot of that either by using like a vaping sort of device, which again, there's probably long-term effects. We don't know about that because it's still a relatively new technology with some of the other things that are included with those uh, liquids. But um, orally speaking, what do you have to consider? We said the onset is not going to be as fast as smoking. How long, okay, so maybe how long is it going to last, but how long before it kicks in? It can be like 60 minutes, 90 minutes before it really starts to kick in. So imagine if, say, someone's like, say, well-versed with, say, inhaling marijuana, typically. They're kind of used to the onset of effects. Imagine you say you get an edible product and you take it and say 30 minutes later, you don't feel anything. What do they do? I'm going to take some more. And 30 minutes later, they still don't feel anything. What do they do? They take some more. So they end up dose stacking. So by the time the first dose really kicks in, they're like, oh no, <laughs> I've taken way too much. And at that point, what can you do for it? Not a whole lot, right? So actually, what, this is some of, the, some of the case reports they found. Uh, there's a good study done by the Rocky Mountain Poison Center in Colorado after medical or recreational marijuana became uh, legal there. And they actually found that uh, they'd have patients who, and again, if you work in an ER, how often do you find patients who are presenting with their chief complaint being, I smoke too much marijuana? Never. You would never, ever find that, right? Because most people have a decent time with it. They don't have any issues, okay? Maybe someone who has a cute paranoid break or something like that, maybe. Um, but this is one of those cases where people were like getting uh, way too much ingested orally. They dose stacked and they came in because they were just way too high. And so they actually called 911 because they're, they're freaking out. And so that they actually saw an uptick in cases like that. So let them know that, hey, be aware of the kinetics of the stuff. It's going to take longer for it to kick in. Don't sit there and just dose stack because otherwise you're going to get yourself into trouble. So those are my kind of my caveats there. Just be aware of the, the kinetics of the drugs and explain how it differs between, say, the oral versus the, the inhaled route. And again, is it like a slam dunk? It's like the it's treatment of choice for anyone in disease state? No, most of the studies find that, hey, it can be effective. Usually they recommend try the medicinal products first. If those are not working, then this is a good as an, uh, as an alternative, right? Um, so for instance, you know, we have marijuana products. We talked about this in the GI section. We talked about in the, uh, the anti-emetic section. We talked about Marinol, right? We talked about Dronabinol being used as basically a synthetic THC. <coughs> Why not use that first? Less regulation associated with it could be a good option. If it's not working, maybe you can try medical marijuana. So I think it's a good alternative, but again, it doesn't really hit the, the ball out of the park uh, in terms of any one thing being like, this is the go-to, this is the drug of choice. Maybe in the future when we have better studies, who knows So. Anyway, um, again, there's a good meta-analysis in 2015 that was done. Um, and basically, they showed, they showed some modest, modest improvements in symptoms, but again, nothing was really a slam dunk. That's two sports references in a five-minute period, which I think is my record. Really smashing that puck through the goalie. Uh, no, sorry, that was bad. <laughs>
I'm not I'm not good at sports, but um, and again, the recommendations from JAMA, right? This is in 2015. Based off that meta analysis, they're basically saying like, listen, you know, if you have a debilitating medical condition that the the randomized controlled trial shows some support for, again, it's worth it's worth a go, right? Um, again, you you risk very little by administering because again, the side effect profile is pretty favorable for the most point. Uh, as long as they're not getting behind the wheel of a car, generally they're not going to have an issue with it. And again, if they have respiratory conditions, I would definitely avoid the inhaled route. Try the oral as an alternative if possible, right? Again, obviously, if they have any kind of, um, you know, underlying substance abuse issue, psychotic disorder, unstable mood, or anything like that, may not be a good drug for them because you can exacerbate those symptoms, but everyone responds a little differently. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, pain management is pretty complex as we've seen. We have a lot of different options that are out there, um, and so everyone needs to be kind of treated as an individual from that standpoint. Um, the biggest roles you're going to be playing is one is educating them, what to look for, what to expect. Again, you have a patient coming with chronic pain, eight out of 10, are you gonna be able to get them down to a zero out of 10? A lot of times, no, you can't, right? So they need to be aware of that. They need to have realistic expectations. Hey, I can't get you to a zero out of 10, but I can get you down to a four. I can get you being more functional, I can get you out of the house. That could be a very a significant improvement to the patient there. So you wanna make sure you have those good frank conversations with them. Um, Again, be aware of things like the titration of it. Start low, go slow. Be aware of conversions if you need to switch from one agent to another. Think of that incomplete cross tolerance that happens with there. Um, and again, help them with the managing the side effects. A lot of times they don't know if whether the side effects they're experiencing are real side effects or it's just their disease getting worse, right? And so you need to educate on that. That way they know the difference between the two. Okay, so any questions on the opioids, pain management in general? Okay, just real briefly, the other big thing I want to talk about here as far as orthopedics go is just venous thromboembolism, how we're going to be managing that because it can be a, uh, a known complication of a lot of orthopedic procedures, especially things like, you know, hip replacements, knee replacements, etc. cetera. Um, good thing is we've covered all the drugs we use for this already, right? So what are we going to use? Lovenox is a good one. What kind of drug is that? Low molecular weight heparin. So it stands a reason for using that. What else can we use? Heparin. What else? Anti 10A inhibitors, right? We're gonna find all these agents are gonna be coming up again, right? Um, so anyway, so again, we know it's a potentially fatal disorder, right? Because where do we worry about the venous emboli going to? The lungs, right? We worry about them going to the lungs, causing PE. People die from, uh, die from that. Um, and again, the idea is you want to try to catch these early enough to where you can administer into coagulants before you need something like TPA to manage this, right? We talked about TPA being the clot buster. Try to activate that um, uh, the breakdown of that fibrin. Again, we saw a lot of side effects associated with TPA, namely being bleeding and death. You don't want that to happen, right? If you're on a clot, you don't want to cause them to bleed to death. Uh, a little bit of egg on your face if you do that, right? Um, so the goal is to try to kind of find this early, right? And so again, you can find a lot of different patients experiencing this. Imagine if you had a patient who was, say, coming in from out of the country. They flew for 24 hours to get here to go to Disneyland, Disney World. Again, that's a very common patient, right? Because again, they, they, they've been sitting down for a good long period of time. There's a lot of venous stasis come in all of a sudden, with all the classic manifestations of VTE. Again, so you're gonna find a lot of different cases where these patients popping up with this. Um, you think about young women, what's the common cause for VTE? Oral contraceptives. We'll talk about that in the ob guide section, come up a little bit later, but that's a very common cause of that. If you have a relatively young woman, no medical history, ask about oral contraceptives. That's probably the, the smoking gun uh, from that standpoint. Anyway, again, big risk factors include, you know, advancing age, history of VTEs, um, obviously, you know, things like, you know, immobility, paralysis, a lot of these patients who are kind of chronically laid up tend to be more likely to have that stasis there. That's where things like, um, you know, chronic anticoagulation can be useful, but what physical means can we use to try to help prevent things like VTE? I heard it. Sequential compression devices, and I'm familiar with those. A lot of times you'll find patients, especially like in the ICUs, uh, if they're ventilated for a long period of time, they'll have SCDs on. And uh, basically they're uh, devices that will kind of compress the leg at different points uh, in a sequential manner to try to force that venous blood to keep flowing, right? So just doesn't hang out there in the lower limbs all day long and then coagulate it uh, or you clot off. Um, as I mentioned, vascular injury here, hip and knee replacements, as I mentioned, is a big one. Um, and then any kind of estrogen-containing therapy is going to stimulate production clotting factors coming from the liver and can uh, predispose someone to clots. Anyway, again, we know how thrombus formation is occurring here. Um, again, we like to prevent it from getting to that fibrin clot because at that point, if it's occluding major vessels in the pulmonary system, then we got to use something like TPA. So if we can, try to prevent that. And again, clotting factors are going to be the main target here, right? Now, what are the main two clotting factors that things like heparin and anoxaparin work on? Factor 10. Factor two, think about what's driving the car of clotting, 10 and two, right? 
You guys all drive like that, right? You want to be very safe out there. Just kidding. Not doing your makeup or something. Anyway, um, review the farm one side if need be. It will be testable. So again, no common side effects of things like heparin. Like, what do I worry about with heparin? Actually, what's a big common side effect of any of these drugs? Bleeding. Bleeding, absolutely. Okay. Um, what about heparin? What if I'm going to have a patient who's on it, say, for, say, they've been on it for 10 days. I'm monitoring them. All of a sudden, I get their CBC on day 11, and their platelets are dropped by 50%. Hit. hit. What is hit? Heparin induced thrombocytopenia. Where do all those platelets go? Am I home? <laughs> they're in a clot somewhere, right? It's kind of counterintuitive. You think they're thrombocytopenia, they must be bleeding. No, that's not the case. Remember, that's uh, sort of uh, almost like an allergic sort of reaction where you're having that platelet factor four being responded to along with the heparin, and that's causing little clot micro clots to happen everywhere. It's not good. How do you treat that? You got switch motor direct thrombin inhibitor, something like our gotcha band. Like Leperudin, something like that, right? So go back and kind of review those. Look at the mechanisms. Look at things you want to worry about. How do I monitor for the effects of heparin? APTT. Some places are now moving more to anti-factor 10A now. APTT is a good one. It's a classic one. How about from monitoring the effects of, say, something like uh, Fondaparinux? Fondaparinux is a exclusive 10A inhibitor. So what, how do I measure that? Anti-factor 10A, right? It's going to tell me how much that uh, 10A is actually being inhibited there. It'll tell me how good of an anticoagulant effect I'm going to get. How could I reverse the effects of, say, heparin? Protamine sulfate is a good way to reverse that, right? Is there any good agents to reverse the effects of, say, like, um, say something like a pixaban? Maybe like a prothrombin complex concentrate, but again, protamine doesn't really work for that so much, right? really works the best for heparin, a little bit for the low molecular weight heparins, but those are things you can think think about. Uh, and in fact, nowadays, a lot of the movement is actually going more towards, if a patient comes in with a venous thromboembolism, they don't even necessarily put them on a, a Lovenox or heparin <coughs> nowadays. They're actually starting to put them more on the oral 10A inhibitor. So things like apixaban, things like um, rivaroxaban are now becoming sort of first-line therapy for that. So we come to the VT and they should give you a pill to take, and all of a sudden you're anticoagulated. So again, that's kind of the move based off studies that have been done uh, somewhat recently. But review that stuff. Could be there on the test. Anyway, so again, most patients, if you're at risk for thrombo, uh, thrombosis, so say you're in the hospital, in a post-operative setting, you're worried about it. This is where we can do things like unfractionated heparin. Sometimes we'll do this subcutaneously, say something like three times a day, or we can use something like an oxaparin, ondoparinux, any things are, are good. And typically the doses here for prophylaxis tend to be lower than you would see for treatment. Uh, and again, the idea here is to prevent the clot from occurring in the first place. And obviously the best thing you can do for these patients is to do what? Say non-pharmacologically. Get them up and moving, right? So again, the earlier they can ambulate, the more they're going to be having that venous blood starting to flow. You're not going to cause all that sludging to occur and cause the thrombosis to happen there. So ideally, you want to get them moving whenever possible. Okay. So again, looking at, say, the um, if you have someone who actually has a confirmed VTE, kind of looking at this, okay, well, what can I do for that, right? So again, they haven't had a pulmonary embolism yet. But how can I prevent that? Obviously, you can do something like a vena cava filter. IVC filter, which can be useful to try to prevent any of those clots from actually traveling up and hitting the lungs. Uh, but if I can give anticoagulation, this is where um, you're trying to find, okay, well, okay, is a PE happen? Is it not happen yet? If a PE has happened, and they're very severe, they're going into shock potentially, this is where something like a clot buster is going to be utilized, right? So something like TPA. In fact, in some cases, we can actually have intracatheter TPA being administered, so that way they actually deliver it right to the clot instead of having to give it systemically. What do you think it does to our um, total dose? lowers it pretty significantly because I'm applying it directly to the clot. This is where IR really comes into play. Interventional radiology can be a big player here. Um, and the dose is a lot less and less likely to see systemic bleeding, which is a, a good benefit there. Um, otherwise, if I don't have necessarily PE started yet, this is where I can get away with something like, you know, treatment doses of anoxaparin, one of our oral anti-10A uh, inhibitors can be useful here um, or to help manage that, right? Again, it's good to know what the kind of the, um, the monitoring parameters are going to be here. Um, Again, so here's where you see our unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and these are good. Um, Rivaroxaban, again, that probably has the most evidence for use so far for treating VTEs. Uh, and again, depending on why they had the clot in the first place will dictate how long they need to be on it for, right? And again, warfarin is starting to kind of go away a little bit because what's the problem with warfarin? A lot of monitoring, right? How do you monitor for the effectiveness of warfarin? INR. Right, you have to measure the INR. It's kind of a pain in the butt because you got to hydrate their dose. It's very diet dependent, right? What what vitamin really plays a role with, uh, with warfarin? 
vitamin K, right? So be careful with that. Now, if you notice here, you can't start off treatment of, of VT or PE with warfarin. Why is that? Well, it takes a couple days to kick in, but also remember which uh, factors have the shortest half life. It's actually the ones that are anticoagulant. So they actually cause, uh, when you initially put someone on warfarin, they're actually in a pro-coagulant sort of state. Remember the heparin bridging we talked about? That's why you do that, right? You have to bridge them from heparin to warfarin in this case when they're having an active clot. Something like riboxamine, you don't have to do that with, right? Because it's directly affecting factor 10. You don't have to be concerned with that. So that's why you can see that's why we're moving away from warfarin more towards these 10A inhibitors because they be, tend to be um, effective almost immediately and tend to be just as effective, okay? Um, and again, thinking about the risk factor. So if someone was on oral contraceptives, is that a reversible risk factor or irreversible? That's a reversible risk factor. I can take them off the oral contraceptives and then that factor is gone, right? Maybe I'll leave them on it for a few months and they come off it. They don't ever worry about that again. They can use an alternative form of contraception, which we'll talk about. I'll be on in section later, right? Um, on the other hand, though, if it's due to a factor deficiency they have, is that reversible or irreversible? It's probably irreversible. I can't really do anything about their genetics, right? I can't change uh, what their clotting factors that they're producing are. So in those cases there, you have to kind of look at the thing. Some people are going to be on lifelong therapy. Some people are going to be on a short-term therapy. I'm not going to get really in the weeds on that as far as testing goes, but know your options. What could be good for treating an acute PE associated with, uh, say, associated with oral contraceptive use, right? You're not going to use warfarin as your go-to because, again, you worry about the, the actual, the procoagulant fat takes to want to kick in. But something like heparin, Lovenox, Pixaban, Riberoxman, any of those would be totally fine, right, to start off with. Can I make therapy? Or kind of make sense about the therapy? Okay. Fantastic. Two hours and 43 slides. I think it's probably a record for me as far as slow, but that's okay. Um, let's check. Any questions so far?